First of all, thank you for coming. Uh, Kevin, what I hope doesn't happen today that we become a uh, we talk, they listen. Uh, I think it's got to be a very Socratic intellectual discussion because one of the problems that I'm hearing on the national level is a cookie cutter will not cut it. It has to be tailorable with core intents identified and as long as that intent is clearly understood they can be achieved in a variety of methods. So what I want you to do is as you listen to this is, is say is the intent rather than the process there and do I clearly understand the intent of why we are doing this. I could give you uh, war stories of uh, why this is happening. Uh, a few of them I will do as to what the genesis of this is. Where are the Vietnam vets in the room? Now, I give you an open forum to tell me that reintegration is not important, not necessarily for you individually, but for your peers. How many of you know someone who is drinking too much that you serve with? Yeah. The, when I came back from Vietnam, and I, I, had a, I had a good tour. I was an advisor. I was out in the bush. I lived with the Vietnamese. I learned a whole new culture. Worked with the Koreans. The least contact I had was with American soldiers. The, uh, basically the helicopters, the medevacs were the, the ones that were the most critical. We had a core policy. If you had some beer, you'd give it to the helicopter pilots so you'd want to reinforce the fact that they do land. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but when I came back home, uh, I went to Travis Air Force Base, Oakland, if you will, the infamous Oakland, because they just had it very clear. There's a green door and a red door. Those of you that have no claims against the United States government, we'll give you your DD-214, God bless you, and go forth and do great things. And the issue was for me as I was out that door, and guess what? It did not hit me on the way out. I was out of there. A couple things happened by accident. My uh, sister lived in Long Beach. And she said, why don't you take a week off, hop the bus, and come visit with me in Long Beach. I did that. She was teaching at the time, so I had the place to myself. I could sleep in in the morning. I'd get up, I'd walk, she was a half a block from the shore, I'd lay on the beach, and then that night she'd come back and she'd take me out and I'd go out drinking and dancing and whatever. I did that for a week. Then I flew home to mom. And I'd gotten some of that stuff out of my system. But when I got off the plane in Fargo, North Dakota, I walked there and there were six people there to greet me. All the immediate family, and that was it. Okay, no problem. I go out, and I meet some of my friends, and they say, hey, Larry, where you been? I haven't seen you for a couple weeks. That's a no shit story, folks. <laughs> I'd been gone for just short, well, two years, 10 months, and 28 days, but who's counting, right? <laughs> And uh, through the most traumatic times in my life, and the people back home didn't even know I was gone. That was the environment that we went into. I go out and I start to meet with some people and we're at the local uh, watering hole, if you will, and I'm sipping on the beer and this gal says to me, uh, where you been? I says, well, I just came back from Vietnam. Oh, you're one of those who was sucking up all my unemployment dollars. Why well, I have to pay all the taxes. Excuse me. And within a few weeks, I quickly learned, don't talk about it. Blend in. Just keep your mouth shut. And then as I did that, and this is the genesis of, of why all this program is coming up. So you could say, well, it's just one person's 
experience and therefore it should not be a, a, a national trend. But in turn, I want the other veterans, you have a moral obligation to say either I'm right or I'm wrong or whatever. But as, as we're doing that, I did not talk about it for 25 years. I mean, I did talk about it. And I say this time and time again, the National Guard saved my life. Because in 1973, as I was dating my wife, she lived in an apartment, and across the hall was a, a Vietnam vet, and we were older than most of the kids on that apartment building, college students. So we'd sit and talk. And then he said, I, you know, I'm a company commander and I need a lieutenant. Could you join the guard? Yeah, why not? I'll go take a look. I joined the guard. For the first four, five, six years uh, at annual training, I'd sit down and you know, those Vietnam vets would kind of get together. I call it, we'd throw a case of beer on the floor and we would talk and talk. We had the war stories back and forth. I mean, everyone, for every war story, there's two more to follow. And when it was all over, we got up and we did not solve one problem whatsoever. I thought. Until I walked out and realized, you know, I'm not the only one. It's not just me. Others are feeling and experiencing the same thing. Then, at the 25-year mark, the local American Legion was in hurt for a speaker uh, for Veterans Day. And I got up and I just told my story. And uh, it resonated well. And I've been speaking a lot ever since. But it wasn't until the Vietnam Memorial, the, the rotating wall, that three-quarter size puppy, that as I started to talk and tell my story, when you have a 50-year-old man come up with tears in his eyes saying, I have my story too, that it came up, it's just bubbling and, 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 and the fact. Now that's kind of the poor pity me side of the house. Until I was over here at Fort Snelling and we had an officer's luncheon and one of our returning troops who was back on his two-week leave was up there talking and he was flipping the slides and he had the pictures of the troops. He had pictures of bodies, which I thought were illegal. They were in my day. And I looked at him and he was just too ambivalent. He was too, and, I, and that's when Kevin said, I saw it. Oh, shit. Then I said to myself, as I'm flying, I was relating that story, and the tag, uh, Mike Haugen out of North Dakota, former tag, said, yeah, we just had two suicides. I've just hired two chaplains to do counseling. And I said, no, I, so I go in and it says, I need to hire someone to be a counselor. By the way, I do not want a chaplain. Why is that? Because I'll be damned if I'm going to have someone sit down and say, let's sit here and pray about it and it'll go away. Well, you got to have a chaplain. Why? Because that's the only slots available. All right, so we advertised for it, and in walks this long-haired hippie by the name of Chaplain John Morris. <laughs> no. Fresh from Fallujah, special ops, been there, done that, and it just clicked. It just clicked. Not only did he have the same vision of what I wanted, but he also had the handouts and the materials and stuff he had hitchhiked from the special ops people. So the genesis of all of this isn't Minnesota. This is a lot of things that collected and gathered all through the Army system. I will tell you, without a doubt, because this happened to me, I've had parents come up to me and say, thank you, thank you, this is what we needed. I've had spouses come up and say, thank you, thank you, thank you. This is just what I needed. I've had troops come up to me and say, can we get out of here a couple hours early? <laughs> the teaching point there is don't get hung up on what the troops say. Conventional wisdom would say, hey, 
what is the best thing they could have done for me when I came home? What's the best thing you can do for the troops when they come home? Every one of them will say, leave me alone. The last thing I want is to hear another order. So I'm asking you, as you do this discussion, are we prepared to go above that level? A good friend of mine, a young captain, did his tour in uh, Iraq, out in the middle of nowhere, brought all his people home, has a very famous quote. Because he told it to me and it stuck. He says, sir, I used to tell my troops, I'd rather they hate me for a lifetime than to love me for one day. That's when he was making sure that they had all their body armor on, the ear protection on, and so forth, because that stuff is a bear. And uh, he would insist on it. He had to live with himself, and that became extremely important. So that's kind of the genesis. Chaplain Morris and team, I think if you listened with Kevin, if, how many have heard Chaplain Morris speak before? All right. Uh, does he have a little passion? All right. Did you sense passion with uh, Colonel Gertis? All right. I will tell you, if you don't hire the right person for this job, you're guaranteed failure. You are guaranteed failure. Rob has given this assignment because we have faith and trust in his ability to get things done. This is not a shove off to the side and we don't know what to do with you type of position. This is part of the triad. It is the equivalent to training. It's the equivalent to uh, equipping. It is the personnel side of the house. Okay? Absolutely critical. I will tell you what we've had more deployments out of Minnesota go doing something that they weren't trained or equipped to do. I'm so sick and tired of hearing we got to reset, reset, reset. And everyone thinks it's a piece of equipment. The number one reset mission has to be our soldiers. We have the finest trained military in our history. And we are flippantly going to throw it away. Now I'm getting a little editorial. I apologize. We're going to flippantly throw it away so that we can buy a new plane or a new tank. And I'm just saying we have to balance this all the way through. And there's a certain synergy. So as we look at this, uh, they have developed a plan. It is a model. I have a standard statement. Minnesota is the second best state in the Union. And they say, what do you mean? We're number one. No, I don't want to get into those contests of who's number one. I want to be associated with 50 states and four territories where every one of them thinks they're number one. That's the attitude I want every state to have, that they're number one. Then when I say, well, I know you're number one, but if you said all the other states, who would be second? Then they all pick Minnesota. So, <laughs> so uh, and, and again, I, 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 there's an old, I'm an old educator. When I got out, I've, I've been in education for 31 years of my life. I started out as a student teacher at a two-year college. I ended up as its president for nine years. I have a doctorate in education. I've dealt with this age group all of my life. I have seen them. I didn't get old. I kept young with each new crop that came in. And uh, these are great people. The Army of One, I, I'll just use this one. I was with General Sinchecki. I was a division commander at the time. And he had a conference at uh, Fort Leavenworth. And they brought in this poor colonel who had to explain why the Army of One slogan was going to be better than be all you can be. If you ever worked in front of a hostile crowd, that was it. <laughs> the research on the Army of One, though, was based on the book, The New Millennials. The New Millennials tend to 
take on the attributes and values of their grandparents. They really, really get, uh, they're focused on that, and I'm trying to sort all of this stuff out. But what the research has shown is these kids don't want to be the best they can be. They don't want to be number one, per se. This whole Maslow's pyramid of needs. They want to be part of something good. Kevin was in charge of recruiting, and I used to beat him up because he says, I'm, we're number one in recruiting. And he says, well, why? Because we got the best recruiters. And I said, that's BS. Do some research. And he did some research. Brought in retirees, uh, current people, and so forth. And what they found out was a young kid coming in has a mental image of what they want to look like when they join the military. And when they walk into that office, they better see it. That person better walk it, talk it, and look it so that they can say, yeah, this is what I want to be part of. And we bend over backwards to make sure, and that's why I like the chaplains here. This is a value-based organization. Flippantly, we say you need 27, 30% of the population are the only ones eligible to join the Guard or the military. Education, physical, and all that other good stuff. But we want to make sure that we provide something positive. Now, I'll kind of take a look at this. The other thing, too, for the DOD people, your mission is to shape the future. Not to get hung up in the weeds, but to shape the future. And I throw this hypothesis out there, or this theory, if you will, and that is, as I reflect back anecdotally to Vietnam, when I joined, I went to uh, Fergus Falls, Minnesota, Alpha Company, young lieutenant, I was the mortar platoon leader in a unit that was maybe 80% strength, they were the draft dodging bags of crap that everyone thought they you know, were supposed to be. Great people, they were. But that was the social image of the guard at that time. Rag bags. You didn't go to training, you went to summer camp. And what'd you do at summer camp? You drank beer and you horsed around and you were one of the boys, all right? That was the image. That was the image I inherited. For two and a half years of training them and so forth, I was trying to get their strength up. To include a call from the battalion commander saying, either you get your strength up or I want you to resign from the guard. And my response was, okay, you can have it now. I resign. Wow, wow, no, wait, wait, wait. can't we wait until after winter training? Because we're getting, that was about a month away. So I go on, I'm, and I said, all right, we've got to get our strength up or I'm going to be in trouble after AT. And uh, the unit performed magnificently. They were not even full strength, and they just kicked butt. So we had a heart-to-heart. -heart. He said, all right, I'm apologizing. We both were a little heated. Uh, I'd like you to stay in, but please get your strength up. But the culture wouldn't allow it. We couldn't get into schools and so forth. Shaping the future, that same unit. My wife and I are going to go there tomorrow. We're going to go and uh, attend a uh, reunion. I just found this this morning, so God intervened and gave me a, a symbol of Saturday, September 22nd. The VFW is sponsoring from four all-day event. They'll have uh, kid activities. They will have an outdoor beer garden. They'll have a band. They'll have food. They've got over 30 some sponsors. Everything is free to the entire community for this small unit that 30 some years ago was treated like garbage. That is the image and the shaping that the reserve component is giving our nation right now for the future.
and how we as a nation build upon that and work on that and take care of them. Um, that, will, that will determine really our future, I really think. Because these young kids want to be part of something good. I gave away and I handed too many flags away in the last two or three years uh, to families. Did every one of them. A lot, well, I'm going to say, I, there's two or three that stick in my mind where the father and mother wouldn't even speak to each other at the funeral. They had to have separate rooms. They had to have separate buses. These are some of the families these kids are coming from. Dysfunctional. And my God, we're upper Midwest. We're God's country. We're supposed to be above that. Lake Wobegon, right? You know, you know if you want to do a study, do a study. And what's the normal family today? But what's happening is these young people want to be part of something good. And also, what I want to make certain is their spouses know that they're part of something good, that they want to stay involved. I guarantee you the spouse will dictate more of it. And I want to just close with this. And Yvonne, would you please stand? All right. She doesn't get paid to do this. No, you can sit down here. <laughs> she doesn't get paid to do this. But I take her along every chance I get. Because I am the general, and you just don't go up and talk to the general. All right? Actually, this is a lonely job. I can be among hundreds of people and still be lonely. Okay? But her, man, they just love to talk to her. And she's a good listener. I picked up more from her on things to listen to. And here is the gaping hole that we have in our program. We take care of the spouses all the way through. I have foundations of millions of dollars. I have a million dollar fund to take care of family. I had all these sugar daddies in the metro area that says, what can we do to help? Well, if you want to make a donation, here's the 501c3. You know, we got her covered. And we've been buying washing machines, dryers, generators, whatever because the number one concern of the troops was take care of my family. But as Yvonne listens to the families, we're at a uh, family, uh, what do you call that, the national, yeah, family conformity conference. We're in Baltimore and met two young gals from southern Minnesota and Yvonne was talking to them and they were talking to her. And she walks away and she says, I sure hope their husbands like each other because those two have bonded and have become very close friends. They're like sisters. And as we bring them back for the 60 and 90 days, we will do the training. And then we bring them back for the 90 days, the troops will, and you're going to see this tomorrow, the, just watch how they're happy to see each other. They miss each other, okay? And as they, uh, as they communicate, we're taking care of the troops. But the gaping hole and if you can help us with this one, I'd appreciate it, is how do we get those family members, the spouses and the parents, how do we get them together so they can throw that case of beer on the floor and sit down and talk about all the things that they're experiencing that is normal, but they're thinking they're doing something wrong. Chaplain Morris uh, uses very often the phrase, a new normal. And, uh, and we're, we're continually discovering it. So uh, we need you. Uh, we need the ideas. One of the beauties of all of the things that we're finding here in the state, fortunately I'm blessed with an excellent governor. The genesis for him was our first deployment when a young kid, I think about five years old, was grabbing him around the leg, tears. And he said, all right, I get it. It's not just the soldier, it's the family. And he has been more than supportive. And all saints aren't that way. I'm sure there's some governors out there that don't know how to spell National Guard, let alone reserve component. It's an unfair statement, but sometimes I, I wonder. So uh, anyway, I, I, 
I apologize for uh, venting, if you will, but my God, uh, they hear it all the time, and they got to know that I'm willing to tell other people too. This is God's work, and I don't consider myself an overly religious person. But I do know that uh, I can sense and feel hurt when I, when I see it. And there's a lot of family out there that are nervous. They are scared. Once they understand that this is normal, even though it's abnormal in the mainstream. And I'll, I'll just, we've shaped the future. Uh, I don't know if you've seen the front page of the Star Tribune. We have one of our troops on it. Front page, a Silver Star awardee. And then uh, for ladies, guys, would you like your daughter to marry a guy like him? I mean, he is a poster boy. <laughs> I mean, I just love it. You know, so recruiting's going up. I don't know. <laughs> so uh, uh, God bless you. Uh, I apologize I'm going to leave. But just to give you the impact of this, I'm going to visit with our officer and list of associations here shortly, and then I'm going to be interviewed by National Public Radio on the follow-on on this type of thing. And then the afternoon I need to speak on something uh, dear, dear to my heart, and that's the uh, uh, national observance for the POW MIA day. And that's why the uniform, why I'm out of uniform or, per se. Uh, so uh, thank you. Uh, uh, you're here. So <laughs> that's a miracle in and of itself uh, with the weather last night, but uh, God bless you. Thank you very, very much. Thank mm -hmm. you.